Thank you very much, Dean Zappenfield, and my privilege to welcome you to the fall conference, the Western Great Lakes chapter of the American Institute of Planners. I was very interested to see how well Dean Sappenfield is fitting into our community. He's the new Dean of the uh, School of Architecture, a new innovation at Ball State University here, and I noticed that he's fitting in very well because when he read the poem, he said, the whistle I can't blow, and I was expecting him to say, the whistle I can't blow. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> I listened very attentively there to that. and uh, Actually, you've come to a city which is much experienced in the field of planning, a city which, like the cities many of you come from, has over the years demonstrated somewhat mixed emotions about this particular field, but a city which we feel nonetheless has been willing to advance, uh, to take the steps we felt were necessary, and to recognize the tremendous importance of your specialty on our way of life. I say we've had mixed emotions, and to demonstrate a little bit, in the past six years we've had four planning directors. We have had three different organizational setups of our planning commissions. So you see, we're trying to try them all. I think we've got the winning combination at the present time. We certainly hope so. I believe, though, that in many ways the shuffling has, as I say, made us a little stronger, a little more aware and knowledgeable of the great importance in this general field. And I remember that during my administration, there have been three planning directors here, and really I haven't had that much to do with it. I hope I haven't been that hard to get along with. <laughs> my comment to the president of the plan commission when he was discussing with me the interview with Mr. Best, uh, before Mr. Best was employed to be our planning director by the commission, maybe indicates some of the attitude that some of us have had. I intended to be humorous and in some areas it was taken as humorous, in some areas it was taken as ridiculous, in other areas it was taken as a, an indication of how backward I am. When I said that, well, from what you've told me about this fellow, all I can say is that anybody who believes in a little spot zoning here and there can't be all bad. <laughs> Actually, our... <laughs> <laughs> Our working relationships, though, have been wonderful to date, and uh, we uh, are certainly look forward to many more wonderful years. I notice your program promises a great deal in the area of worthwhile discussion. I hope that while you're here, you're able to enjoy our city. Most groups I walk them, I say, take a good look at our city, and we know you'll find things that you like. Well, with this group, <laughs> I'm a little cautious about making that statement, although I'll still go ahead and say that I hope you do take a look at Muncie, and I hope you do like what you see. I know that you'll find that the people in our city are happy and proud to have you as our guest for this short time, and we hope that you'll like us well enough to want to come back again. Thank you again. I hope you have a wonderful conference. When I uh, found out that I was to introduce uh, President Emmons, I asked his office to give me a list of his qualifications and degrees, and it is really a lengthy thing. It would take a half an hour to list the organizations he's been president of or the degrees he's had. But I think the, the most important thing that I could say about President Emmons is that he came here 22 years ago to a little teacher's college that had just slightly over a thousand students. This year we have 13,000 students and it's uh, when I first came here I thought well I must be coming into the university at a time when everything is changing and I thought that uh, just because we had a new college of architecture and planning and a new department of nursing that uh, we were transferring from college status to university status 
that because we were trying very hard to get the new medical school for Indiana here on our campus, that this must be the, the real time of change on campus. But when you look back over these 20 years and you see this growth from 1,000 to 13,000 students, I think you can see that, that President Emmons has been involved in this change for a mighty long time. President Emmons. Let me too welcome you to the campus. I have a sort of a pattern that I've tried to follow over a period of years when I give a welcome to groups, and I'm sure you know that there are many opportunities to do this. I try to say you're welcome, and I hope you do feel welcome, and secondly, I try to brag a little about the campus. I think that's prerogative a president has. And then I try to express one idea. This morning, I'm, I would like to say a little about the kind of thing that uh, is important in terms of planning. Um, and if you're in a community such as we are with 70,000 people or approximately that in a county with 100,000 people, and you're an integral part of it, uh, this presents a different kind of planning or two aspects of planning that uh, some of you may have in the communities in which you're located and some of you may not have. There are two aspects, for instance, that we have to be aware of. Number one is planning on campus. And when I tell you, for instance, that the first, one of the three first steps that I tried to make when I came was to inform the board that we needed a long-range plan and we had to have an architect to do it. And the architect was appointed in the first biennial report that was made in 1946-47, presented a long-range campus plan. I'll just tell you how much patience it takes to have planning made. <laughs> Uh, in that plan, there were four major items that I will call four major items. There were many others, but the four that uh, are they're rather interesting were that we needed uh, to have a student center. We need to have a library that would house 250,000 volumes. We needed to have an auditorium, and we needed a football stadium. Now, they were put in about that order. And let me tell you that, for instance, that was 1946-47. 52, we got the first unit of the student center. In 63, we got the second unit of the student center in which you're now located. In 1964, we got the auditorium. In 1962, we passed the 250,000th volume in the library, and we hope this year to get the stadium. Now, this talks about patience in terms of planning as well as terms of long-range planning. I think you understand that on a campus of this kind, a state-assisted institution, I am unwilling anymore to call it a state-supported institution, I'll call it state-assisted, uh, <laughs> that we have a, a series of long-range plans that we have to make just in terms of construction of buildings. For instance, buildings of this kind, student centers, auditoriums, health service centers, uh, stadiums and the like, there are no tax dollars of any kind which go into them. These are all either student-generated or donor-generated. Our residence halls are in another classification, and these are all paid for because they are self-liquidating. No tax dollars in residence halls. So you get down to the part of the buildings which are, or were up until this biennium, a part of the state tax dollar. These were the classroom buildings. The last legislature in Indiana decided the taxpayers couldn't afford to build the classroom buildings anymore, but that the students could. So now we have bond issues for over 50% of the classroom buildings, as well as the other programs that are constructed out of income other than tax dollars. For instance, we have a little over $20 million worth of construction going up on the campus at the present time, and the Indiana tax appropriation for this biennium for construction was less than $3 million. This tells you something about the kind of planning that has to be done internally on a campus. Now, in addition to that, and I'm sure that uh, Mayor Hampton would agree, we bring with 13,000 students, 5,000 of whom are in residence halls, which we have constructed, and of course this relates to the total process of surface water, sewage, uh, traffic problems. This indicates, for instance, we have approximately 2,500 pedestrians uh, every hour in certain spots. But in addition to that, we have in the day approximately we have about 2,500 cars that are registered. So traffic problems and such things as this, as well as these other problems, become an integral part of long-range planning for a city in which you have located a university. What did I say? Did I miss it somewhere? 
you think that, oh you think it's he says it feels like twenty five thousand and I would agree with him. Uh, twenty five hundred is the number, however, that we do. But you see, you get thirteen thousand students, a thousand faculty and staff, a thousand youngsters in the Burris Laboratory School, which is our campus laboratory school, a thousand people at the hospital, and these are pedestrians. And then you bring in to that complex, uh, say, twenty five hundred cars a day over and above the normal flow of traffic from people going to work and back and forth for their regular business, and you create long-range planning problems. This is one of the reasons why we feel that it's so important that we work together. Well, this is a part of the complex on the university campus that we have. The one idea that I have that I hope uh, I've tried to already express is that somehow or other planning is an absolute necessity and that along with planning, there must be a certain amount of uh, another word that begins with P, and that's patience. I really and truly thought that this planner's lament could be the university president's command. <laughs> I think it fits us pretty well. Thanks for listening, and we're glad you're here. Thank you. The, the first part of our program today is uh, a movie that's uh, rather dear to my heart. It's the AIA film, No Time for Ugliness. I'm sure that a few of you have already seen this film. It's about a 20-minute film, and uh, I feel very, very strongly that uh, everybody in Indiana and everybody in this region should see this, uh, this film. The, we'll try to uh, work in 20-minute uh, blocks of a, with a talk by John Peterson and a talk by Sam No, and then we'll have uh, just a few minutes after that, and we can uh, throw some questions uh, back and forth. So if we could start the uh, movie now. If you come on up. Yeah. <laughs> When the mayor said uh, said uh, can't, he probably was uh, saying what would be my natural inclination. I felt like I should get another uh, North Carolinian on the program here just for uh, for support uh, anyway. But truthfully, the reason I asked John Peterson here today was because he had told me some very interesting things that he had been doing as a member of the City of Cincinnati Planning Commission Committee on Sign uh, Zoning Controls. And uh, he had sent me some information on it, and I really haven't had a chance to read it, so I'm hoping to get an explanation so I'll know what I'm reading when I read this zoning uh, controls. John is Associate Professor of Architecture at Cincinnati. He graduated in Architecture at North Carolina State, and he got a Master's Degree in Architecture at MIT. Since that time, he's been on the faculty at Cincinnati. He, uh, in addition to his teaching and to his serving on the Sign Zoning Commission, is also uh, interested in painting and in sculpture. John Peterson. Uh, thank you, Dean Sappenfield. Uh, Zoning and uh, urban aesthetics uh, seems a rather broad topic for a simple North Carolina boy. But uh, I'm going to be basically concerned here, as Charlie outlined, with signs as they refer to uh, the urban aesthetic and as they are affected by zoning. Um, Cincinnati, just as most cities, uh, has a very distinct problem with signs, and I think the effect of signs on the cityscape was more than well documented by the movie that you see here. In any case, 
the problem in Cincinnati was perpetrated by many situations. The usual sources of women's clubs and uh, garden clubs, chambers of commerce, believe it or not. Abuses by politicians during campaigns with uh, many signs being plastered all over the city without uh, concern for where they were being placed or whether they were being removed. One of the more important things was the fact that the city is now going through rather extensive uh, renewal, change. Many of the parts of the city are being torn up. New businesses are being put in. And some of them begin to want a lot more signs because of the sign base which exists in the city itself at present. To give you an idea, the extent to which the sign situation has developed, uh, there was one particular half of a block in the core area in Cincinnati in which a new building uh, was to be placed. When they tore down the buildings, cleared the street, on one half block strip, 350 signs were taken down in one half block strip. Unfortunately, 250 of these belonged to the city. <laughs> Unfortunately, the city is kind of immune to uh, zoning codes in this respect, so uh, this becomes an entirely different problem, I would, I would suppose. So the problem brought to bear, uh, how would you go about solving this? Well, as every good planner knows, you first thing you do is to form a committee of all of the people who make the loudest noise. And... If after approximately a year or two the committee hasn't killed itself, and if they're still speaking, chances are you might come up with an idea. And this is where I became involved. I was appointed by our local chapter of the AIA to represent them on this committee. Uh, all references to the committee system notwithstanding, this particular committee worked quite well. Now, we made several false starts. Quite obviously, uh, we are very much affected by the things that we saw in the movie this morning. The sign clutter, the glare as you drive down a street. Things. It's almost like being inside of a visual drum with somebody beating on it. At the same time, we are aware that uh, many cities have uh, good sign codes. Some of them bad, some of them work, some of them don't work. So we started in the obvious place by reviewing the old code which existed. Came to the obvious conclusion that it doesn't work. We reviewed the sign codes of many, many cities one, a neighbor city, has a sign code that covers just one page, one printed page, which is the extreme of simplicity. Some of them covered as many as 50 to 60 pages in the codes. Probably the most uh, intriguing to all of us, and the one that is always cited as the model of codes, is the New York Fifth Avenue Code which is highly restrictive, no projecting signs, no lighted signs. And this is the usual approach that one would like to take in, in sign uh, codes and zoning, to be rather restrictive. <laughs> you would like to say no signs at all, but that's, this is unreasonable. The businessmen would never let you get away with it. 
and I think rightly so, because the city lives by virtue of the businesses which exist within it. On the other hand, the workings of a city are, I have become increasingly aware at any rate, a much more flexible and diverse thing. So the, the Fifth Avenue Code may be fine for a very specific situation as the situation in which it is applied. At this point, the committee made a rather, dis rather distinct discovery. There are two basically opposing forces working in the city as, as regards to signs. One is the character of the environment that these signs exist in. And one is the character of the sign itself and its needs and uses. I think these two things are, well, I, I, I use the comment here that they are opposing forces. And I think this is probably a uh, very good analogy here in that uh, the sign is trying to say something, the environment is trying to do something else. Uh, and how do you begin to equate these things? Well, we thought, well, why not put these two forces in opposition to each other and let them control each other? We made another discovery that because of this flexibility, this pluralistic nature of the environment and of the city, that the old codes were uh, basically lacking in a flexibility to adapt themselves both to the needs of the sign and the needs of the environment in which they exist. Aside from that, there is also a rather dangerous psychology working in a normal restrictive code, as I like to call them. You give somebody a specific size and a specific position, and you have, in effect, designed all of the signs for all of the establishments in the city. Because there is this, this psychology of reaching the limit. Everyone will want to go precisely to the outside limit of what he is allowed by the law. And therefore, on the one hand, the community tries to force the limits lower, and those who want sign tries to try to force the limits higher, and you have an irresolvable situation. And in some cases, you have attempts at violation. So we begin to ask ourselves two basic questions. What is the character of the environment and what is the character of signs? And are there any measurable factors in these two elements which we can use? And are there any factors which are already measured? And we found that there were some. And we started, I think, with the basic zoning code, resident zones, business zones, office zones, etc. This became our initial structure. And from there, we began to go into other things, such as speed of traffic, the types of establishments that we are getting, the sizes of these establishments kind of business they are running, whether they're big businesses or small businesses, whether they are multi-use multi establishments or single-use establishments. Some of these things we can measure, some we can't. In terms of the size or the signs themselves, we found that all right, there are the normal things, sign, uh, size illumination, whether it moves or not, where you put it, how you put it, what color it is, what shape it is. Here again, some of these are measurable, some are not. Well, then we came to final question. Can we assign values to the environment? I mean, numerical values. Can we assign numerical values? values to the sign. 
Well, we thought we'd give it a try at any rate. And we came up with a system. And I'm going to explain two charts here that we came up with. The first chart, we plotted across the top of the chart all the zones in a descending degree of desirability, maybe, or an ascending degree of liberalness, if you will, starting out with the single-family residence, going to the multifamily, the office zone, the business zones, the manufacturing zones, and this formed the basic framework for the first chart across the top. And then we settled on three basic factors going down the chart. The size of the establishment, the type of street that it was on, and the use to which the establishment was put. Now, under each of these, the size is obvious. This was linear front feet of exposure. The street type, we broke down into four basic categories. Fast traffic, meaning uh, expressway speed. Medium traffic, uh, normal cross-town roads, where you get above, let's say, uh, I believe we set it at 35 miles an hour. And slow traffic, under 35. Other residential or shopping center speed. And then the fourth, pedestrian, where there was no traffic at all. To each of these factors, we assigned a value. And in the use type, uh, which was our largest list, uh, residents, uh, multi-residential, institutional, businesses, uh, sales, uh, and as you can imagine, the list was rather long. And to each of these, we assigned a value. So from each of these three areas, you applied your particular situation. And you came up with a total number of points. Now we had a second chart. This was our sign chart. Now what are the, me what are the factors that we can measure in this situation? Well, obviously in the probably prominent in, in importance, the size of the sign. So many points per square foot of sign. Next, and maybe just a very small bit less important than the size, the illumination. And we had several different areas. And this was our most argumentative area, I should point out. Well, we had non-illuminated, non direct illuminated, indirect illuminated, direct illuminated flashing, indirect illuminated flashing. We finally arrived at the point where we assigned values on the basis of points per amp. Uh, this is a rather crude method. Uh, short of protests by our building department, we would have liked to have had the reading at street level in lumens. Uh, but the uh, building department was rather reticent to let us do this. They'd rather look at an electrical box and count the amps. Then we had factors as to whether the sign was going to move or not. How far back the sign was set. The further back, the more points you got, or the, the fewer points were assigned. Height, number of points per foot vertically. Method of attachment, whether it was a wall sign, or a projecting sign, or a marquee, or a canopy. And the message type, whether it was a real estate for sale sign, whether it was an institutional identification, uh, a professional sign, business sign, or advertising sign. And each of these received a certain number of points. So, as it worked out, the signs from the first, the, the points from the first table gave you your total number of allowable points. It doesn't say anything about the sign. You just have a, you just have a number. And if you apply this to your second table, you come up with another number. That number can't exceed the number from the first. 
It can equal it, but it can't exceed it. Well, very quickly, uh, let's say for the size of establishments, you have five points. For the street type, uh, you have five points. For the use type, you have five points. You have a total of 15 points to work with. Uh, and let's say you have a, a one point sized sign, uh, a two point illuminated sign. Uh, you have another point for the fact that it's moving. You have another point for the fact that it's set back so many feet, another point for it because it's so high. Another point because it's a wall sign, not a projection sign. Another point because it's an institutional sign. I don't know whether those add up at the moment. But the initial was 15, and let's say the signs were uh, 13. Let's say you want a little bit more sign, and you've got it illuminated. Well, you've got two points to spare. So, well, with two points to spare, we can make it flashing. Or uh, with two points to spare, maybe we don't want to make it flashing. Uh, we want to make it a little bigger. Or let's say uh -huh, we're going to have some temporary signs sometime. So let's leave those two points for a poster that we may want to use. Or a special sale. Quite obviously, from what I'm trying to point out here, this, the system is a completely flexible one. The man with the sign is capable of, within the limits of the point he has, of designing the kind of sign that he needs to fit his environment. If his neighbor has one that's brightly lit, he may want a little bit more size. If one is low down to the sidewalk, uh, he may want to put his up a little higher. Maybe it gets a little smaller, but he can at least be seen. Well, this is obviously, as I feel, the, the great advantage that we assign no absolute direct limitations in this sense. We don't say that you cannot have a sign bigger than. You can't put out more than so many watts of power. In other words, this code in this sense is not dictatorial. It does not dictate to the particular user the kind of sign that he is going to be able to use. And in that sense, I believe at any rate, this is a little bit more uh, associated with the type of environment that he's going to be in. There's a little secret psychology going here, too. As I pointed out, the, the, the danger of setting an absolute limit on size, this is obvious, as I have pointed out. However, with this particular system, by not giving absolute values, we've got to force the sign man to design his sign. We aren't giving him a sign. He's got to juggle these factors. He's got to consider what he's doing. And if we're lucky, he may begin to look at the environment that he's working with. Further, he may even begin to think about such things as aesthetics. Now, all of the aforementioned uh, seem to work for us. There's only one rather major problem. The system doesn't work. <laughs> During the summer, we... Uh, or early this summer, we brought the code up to the university and gave it to several design classes and had them apply it in several street situations. The thing we found was while 
as long as we were dealing with normal, and don't ask me what I mean by normal, but normal situations, the code did everything we expected it to do. It was perfect. However, when we began to get involved with extreme situations, everything went out of whack. If we got a, as is often the case, a very large institution in a residential community, uh, they could have a sign the size of a 20-story building, not literally, but about the same proportion. Or if we got a very, very small uh, slot for a cigar store in the urban area, uh, as opposed to getting a very, very small little sign, which would suit his purposes, he got a huge sign. There were other and more involved situations that came about. Now, the reason why this came about is because in the initial assigning of values in this system, these were assigned quite arbitrarily. This is the only way we had a beginning. I don't mean we just went down and said, all right, five points here, five points here, five points there. We started out with uh, a given number, and then we started just intuitively weighing these values. All right, if you've got a, a lighted sign, you get so many points. Well, uh, a lighted direct sign uh, flashing should be more points, so we started adding up. So quite obviously, when you get into a situation where you have all the factors on both charts acting as variables, and all of these variables are cross-related, the permutations become quite interesting. Obviously, this becomes a case of uh, a computer application. Now, the next question comes, is the system still valid? Uh, yeah, I believe it is, though the particular committee that I'm working on has decided to go to a little more conservative variation of it. I think, though, as pointed out, there is a highly intricate uh, situation here in terms of all the variables. Uh, the code is easy to apply. This was proved by the fact that the students were able to comprehend it and to apply it and to very thoroughly abuse it as we asked them to. But nevertheless, it still is easily applied. It's easily amended. If the situation is too stringent or too loose, once you have all of the permutations figured out by the little black box in the corner, it's very easy just to start adding or subtracting numbers in the proper spot. You don't have to pass rather uh, legalistic code terms. But I think more important, it does provide real limits to the situation. But it offers a kind of flexibility that is necessary in the environments in which we're existing. And I believe it is probably more responsive to the aesthetic requirements of the city. I think you'll have questions later, John. I have a question. Planning the program, I didn't realize that we would have uh, more than, than Sam and John here from Cincinnati. Sam uh, felt that there was a little bit of confusion in saying that he was acting head of the Community Planning Department of the University of Cincinnati at the same time that we had uh, Dr. Robert C. Hoover, professor of planning at the University of Cincinnati. It turns out that Cincinnati, like uh, Ball State, has two different areas in which we teach uh, planning in uh, different directions. Sam is uh, in the undergraduate area of planning in the architecture school, and our speaker for this evening 
is in the graduate uh, section at uh, Cincinnati and in a different uh, portion of the university. Sam is a, is a native of Louisville. He studied first at Princeton, then graduated uh, uh, in architecture at North Carolina State, and from there went uh, for a master's at Harvard. As the announcement says here, he's currently acting head of their community planning department at Cincinnati. Sam? I might say that, that uh, one of the reasons for my getting Sam here was the very interesting work that was published, oh, about six, five or six months ago in Progressive Architecture, very interesting work uh, which he did with students. Sam? Well, your topic uh, is aesthetic zoning, uh, and if we can translate this a bit, maybe uh, my particular interest will be a bit more appropriate, as was John's. Perhaps we can call it design controls. Now, uh, you've heard about one approach just now uh, by which design controls can be uh, set up, which allow the various decision makers in the community to uh, exercise their particular interests. And I think this is quite important. It's a topic that I'm going to speak to this morning also because I think uh, too very often designers of any sort and environmental designers in particular uh, have the tendency to feel that they are sole decision makers and this can only lead to frustration. But let me back up uh, just a little bit because uh, I want to talk generally this uh, concerns urban design. Now this is a tough term to pin down. Uh, as you may have discovered. Now for every user there's there's a definition and mine for what it's worth uh, is just this. It's the business of making places and of connecting these places together. It's nothing more than that. Now by place what I mean uh, is any physical location being capable of clear visual identification with reasonably distinct boundaries and intended for satisfactory use by people. Rockefeller Center Skating Rink, which you saw, is a place. 3726 Elm Street is not. Chinatown is a place. Most of Indianapolis is not. School districts and sewer districts are not places, but generally, and generally speaking, the city park is. Now, in order to properly satisfy man's need to identify with his environment at all scales, we must see that he lives daily in a great bunch of large places and small, and not spend his life in the limbos of the Elm Streets and the Roosevelt School District. Well, now, this is by way of preamble, and this leads back to this matter of getting urban designs implemented, which really is a critical thing. Designers are a dime a dozen. You can get them anywhere. Now, it's pretty commonly accepted by most people, as I mentioned, except designers, that uh, designers are to various degrees egomaniacs. Uh, this is both a blessing and a curse. Uh, it's a blessing because we as designers, and I'm one, uh, are driven to produce the finest possible creation that we can for public recognition. I think that's quite often the prime motivation. Uh, it's a curse because it causes us to have the delusion that as environmental designers we are the principal decision makers in the creation of urban form. In actual fact, of course, we're only primary decision makers in the hopeful world of the drafting room. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe very strongly that the environmental designer must be an artist. And an artist without a vision is no artist whatsoever. But the real world facts of decision making just can't be ignored. The complexity of decision structure varies, of course, according to the culture and the particular situation. Planners of new towns in the Soviet Union or in Great Britain have a lot going for them. Their client, quote and unquote, has the land, the money, and the power to build pretty much according to their master designs. The situation is analogous, of course, to uh, other cultures in history, uh, for example, Napoleon III and Baron Hausmann. Now, the developers of, an, of a new American shopping center have very little difficulty in implementing their designer's vision. But if you assign me 
to prepare a physical design for a downtown urban renewal area, for example, you've invited me to participate in a very, very complex decision-making structure. This is no secret to anybody here. It's a secret to most designers, but not to you. Uh, my personal role is no more decisive, of course, in that structure than that of 20 other individuals, probably many more. And this is a very common situation. The big question then is, how can I, as the artist in such a situation, realize my vision? Not come up with it, but realize it. Now, most environmental designers are doomed to failure as a result of their training in this famous ego. Very few designs, no matter how excellent, which are inflexibly detailed down to the last structure and satisfying only the designer's personal goals uh, can possibly see the light of day. On the other hand, a design which can fully shift with the objectives of every investor, every politician and bureaucrat, which can completely acknowledge the daily flux of business interest, the press criticism, the money market, which can wholly satisfy every single party at interest. Any design which can do that is no design at all. It's a sellout to the many advocates of the many daily expedients, and the result is absolute chaos. Now, what do we do? There lies the dilemma. A possible escape uh, is a process which I call strategic urban design. Now this is nothing more than a system which recognizes a decision structure, which attempts to anticipate all these external forces, or as many as possible, and as many as we can recognize, uh, which recognizes decisions and trends which will affect design, and which attempts to channel these to a desired end. Now the tools of this type system are the same as that empl those employed by any designer plus, and this is the big added ingredient in my opinion, a clearly constructed and pre-tested package of development opportunities and controls. And I'm speaking now at the scale of urban design in general in exactly the same way that John's just spoken with you about sign controls. Now the best way to describe this, I think, is with an example, and if we could have the lights out and see some slides, I'll very quickly go through one application of this, and you can judge it for yourself. Big, big background, it doesn't matter where this is or what it is exactly, only to say that right in this area uh, we have a situation where there will be total clearance and modern income house is to be replaced. Now this area joins the major downtown district, the central part of the central business district is in here but it spills over just to the north, immediately across this major artery. To the south, there is additional residential development of uh, reasonably decent structures, uh, but on the wane and probably will be ready for replacement before uh, much of this has been completely implemented. Movement paths in the area, uh, mainly the east-west route, which you see in black, are the through routes to downtown. The north-south routes, which you see here, uh, lined by red, there's another one. Uh, are what you might call stop and go streets, the commercial type of streets where you can park for 15 minutes, make purchases, line with stores, and so forth. All these other streets are local residential distributors. There is a major expressway running through the middle of the site in an open trench, a wide open trench. On this same right of way, a subway line which stops at the two extremities of the particular site. Uh, to give you some idea of scale, this is one very narrow residential block of approximately the same width as those in central Manhattan. Could I have the next slide, please? Uh, a very uh, schematic land use map which shows, among other things, in red, uh, the primary <coughs> concentration of commercial facilities oriented toward residents in this area and in blue, the educational facilities. It's the university over here. These are local schools of one level or another. Next slide, please. 
It's just to put you in the picture real quick. Now, I mentioned that I considered urban design to be the business of place making, places with which people can identify. In starting a design, it becomes very necessary to analyze the activities of people, what they do, how many people they associate with and as they're engaged in these different activities. And I think it's possible to establish a hierarchy of uh, activity uh, concentrations according to the numbers of people involved in a particular function. So in order to begin to give the design some structure, uh, in this particular case, uh, four distinct uh, nodes, if you want to call it that, and I'm referring to activity concentrations and not to geographic locations at this point, were isolated. A core, which might be that point, for example, in a high-rise structure where people gather, get on the elevator to go off their floor, which might have a playroom, a lounge, and a laundry, this sort of thing. Uh, a parcel, which for example might be uh, that concentration of activities which you find at the base of one of these high-rise towers, uh, immediately uh, at the base <coughs> and around it, serving the people in that building, which would have a garage, a playground, for example, some small convenience store, coffee shop, bar, and so forth. A sector, the next largest unit, where people come together for functions they cannot uh, realize at the uh, two smaller scale. Uh, in this case, programming, a kindergarten through third grade school, local shopping, convenient shopping, day nursery, accommodations for visitors, restaurants, and a major transit stop. And finally, a district which maybe corresponds to the, uh, the suburban shopping center in terms of intensity of activity and numbers of people with school grades four through eight, churches, library, recreation center, movies, commercial centers, clinics, professional offices, this sort of thing. Next slide, please. Now, obviously, while you're uh, starting to consider human activity uh, strictly apart from the business of physical form, uh, as a designer, uh, the images are starting to click off in the mind, and you're making little sketches and thinking, what are the important physical aspects? And many, many sketches start to evolve. This is only one in this case in which uh, we're starting to talk about, uh, starting to have a look at light controls, challenges to the left in this particular case, making sure that your open spaces are adequate, are well lighted, realizing this problem of a major high speed artery through, what can we do about sound control, noise, uh, many of these aspects, parking, how this might be accommodated, uh, where your service routes are, many of these things. And this is only one of many sketches, and I, I've interjected here to show you that uh, the, the, the form aspects are almost on an intuitive basis, but bringing in many of the uh, form determinants have to start perking at the same time you're considering human activities. You bring them along together. Uh, next time, please. Next slide, please. Now, up to this point, I haven't told you anything that you couldn't find uh, any designer doing in, in an urban design situation like this. But the designer must realize, and I think that this is uh, the big departure, that he is probably not going to be the person who designs these things down to the last dotted I and cross T. If other people are, people he knows and respects, people he doesn't know, uh, people whom he thinks are, are absolute hacks and people that are going to be operating 5, 10, 20 years from now. Uh, we heard this this morning in, in the President's introduction of, of the history of the development of this very campus. So we have to remain flexible and we have to develop controls. And these are urban design controls. They're not just land use zoning and, and some of the more conventional controls which we know in most cities now. And they have to be, in my opinion, uh, worked out jointly with designer and the political decision makers. Uh, as well as with the various other business entities that uh, will be involved in the situation. Now, in this case, here is a diagram which shows certain of these controls. I call these the building envelope controls. Wherever you see uh, gray shaded on this uh, plan of the particular area which I described to you, uh, it is possible to build. Anywhere where there's no shading, where it's just plain paper, you may not build. Wherever, and, and in these gray shaded areas, you may build, in this case, to a height of three stories. 
wherever you see, and, and probably if you're sitting in the back, you're gonna find difficulty, uh, long horizontal bands of, of lines closely spaced together. There's one across here, one across here, and big points in here. Wherever you see these bands of lines, uh, you can build to a height of six stories. Wherever you see these rectangles, you can build to an unlimited height. Now you see two rectangles cross, uh, this implies a building tower. You may build either in the north-south orientation or the east-west, but not both. Wherever you see this dark square, uh, you may establish your vertical movement system, your elevator tower. This is an <coughs> ordained street. It just has to be vertical. Now all of these are merely ordinances. These lines, which you see here, these uh, dashed lines, indicate the boundaries between development parcels. Now, as a potential developer in this area, you are free to come in and pick any one of these parcels you want for development. If you're a small developer, here's something which might be appropriate to your capabilities here. If you're a large developer, you may want to do one of these towers. If you're even larger, you may want to do a whole quad. You can have whatever you like. It's very important, however, to establish quite a wide range of sizes of these development parcels because if you don't, you're going to get a one-sided sort of thing and you may retard uh, investment. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? This uh, is another diagram of the same area, of course, which shows the movement net. Wherever you see uh, white, pure white, on this sort of bluish thing, this is vehicular circulation. There are two circulation loops, one here, one here. That's going to be clear on at this point, as I recall. Um, these serve the parking garages, which will be ordained in these locations. Wherever you see closely spaced dashed lines, these represent ordained paths of pedestrian circulation at an elevation 20 feet above the ground. Wherever you see widely spaced dashed lines, these indicate paths of pedestrian circulation at grade. Now, this makes up your, uh, your core of uh, your, your systems of circulation. Again, nothing has been built. These are merely controls which have been established. Here again are your vertical circulation paths, which I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, parking facilities, when they are built, and they must be built by any person developing residences in this area, uh, must follow this pattern. There would be a standard uh, layout of parking. Here we show a uh, two double rows of parking, 120 feet wide, uh, which of it are of the depth as yet indeterminate, of course, because we don't know in any parcel how many units, how many cars we're gonna need to park, a continuous spiral moving either up or down. The height, of course, is limited by the building envelope controls which you saw. Next slide, please. And finally, land use, building use if you prefer, uh, red, commercial, traditional, uh, yellow for uh, residential development, the gray is the parking, blue institutions of various types, <coughs> and the white are buildings uh, which are built with public funds and over which it was assumed at, this, at the time this design was done that the designer might exercise more direct control uh, than he might working with private developers. Uh, the fund further reflection, I'm not so sure this is true because I think we know of the problems of, of the planning department uh, getting the school to, uh, board to build exactly as they had in mind or where they had in mind, even the problems between two organizations which might be uh, closely, supposed to be working closely together such as Urban and Rural and FHA. Uh, I think Mr. Patterson uh, knows something about this in Louisville. Um, but at any rate, at the time, it was assumed that you might make a more direct contribution to form in this way. And in some communities, perhaps you probably can. Uh, it's a question. Now, here are three packages of controls. We're used to controls. We're used to land use zones. We're used to building ordinances. We're used to uh, setbacks, zoning controls, and so forth. These things would be in addition or in substitution to these things, as is deemed appropriate. Now. In a sense, this is really as far as an urban designer can go, in a sense.
But at any rate, at the time, it would assume that you might make a more direct contribution to form in this way. And in some communities, perhaps you probably can. Uh, it's a question. Now, here are three packages of controls. We're used to controls. We're used to land use zones. We're used to building ordinances. We're used to uh, setbacks, zoning controls, and so forth. These things would be in addition or in substitution to these things as is deemed appropriate. Now, in a sense, this is really as far as an urban designer can go, in a sense, uh, at least working at this strategic scale. However, I think it's very important to test these things. You heard Mr. Peterson talking about tests and assigned controls with the students. I think it's important for the man who conceived these controls to be uh, sufficiently capable to handle physical design to test them himself to put on, if you like, an architect's hat or another type of urban designer's hat and test these. Could I have the next slide, please? Uh, well, I'm a little bit ahead of myself. This is merely a slide which shows a possible sequence of development. Black, the first stage development, gray second, and white third. Uh, this is only what one would suppose would happen. This is not intended as a control, but since you have commercial nodes and subway stops at this point, one would suppose that this thing might grow outward from these points and eventually knit. Uh, you should be aware of these things, but I don't think it's, it's right to try and control these too uh, stringently because then you're, uh, you're getting into the realm of land economics and the designer is not really competent to deal with these things or to predict what will happen. We should allow maximum opportunity. Next slide, please. Now, uh, here, uh, begins a test. This is the northwest quadrant of this area which you saw. The designer now takes on the role of the, uh, of the physical designer, the literal physical designer who gets down as far as general architectural design. Um, here you see a plan at the level of elevation 20, the level of the pedestrian paths uh, which I explained to you. You see low-rise housing flanking these paths which now become real. Uh, here are your parking garages. If you remember your building envelope controls, you could not build at this point, so the garage had to go underground. You see a road going down here and into a garage underneath. The garage then pops up above ground. Your spiral gets shorter as it gets to this end. It cannot go above two stories because the developer is required to cover all parking with housing in this particular case. That's a control I neglect to mention. Uh, at this case, at this point, you see your, your school, kindergarten through third grade, your small commercial nucleus. There are a few shops around here which work at the uh, core level of activities, which I showed you on one of the early diagrams. Uh, here is a commercial street along here, which does not serve the community, uh, this particular community at all, but the downtown community. Shops are placed on this, oriented away from this development, and building a wall against the the noise of downtown. Uh, here you see a bridge going across the two, uh, or going across the subway and highway right of way. Uh, in order to avoid the feeling that this community is completely split in two and that you're going out into a, a foreign and terrifying world when you cross this bridge, uh, institutional facilities are placed flanking this. Uh, air rights are given to. Uh, interested parties who would like to develop here, in this case, for example, a clinic and a parochial school. There is a precedent for this in this particular community. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, what, hold it, just one second. These are your towers dotted above this. Uh, they can, as I say, be oriented in different directions. These are the ones that were chosen in this particular case. Next slide, please. Uh, the same sort of thing down at uh, the ground plane. You can see more of it. The school spills down over the parking, the houses spill down around the parking. In no case are parking garages allowed to be exposed to the outside. They're always enclosed by additional uh, facilities which are more compatible with the open space. Next slide, please. Uh, I think it's very important for an urban designer uh, to understand enough about architecture that he uh, doesn't fall into the pitfall of, uh, of proposing